Hey, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bible Believers Community Church where the name says it all. And I'm happy to see that folks remembered <laughs> we're in daylight savings time. And I know that when this airs, it'll be a week after daylight savings time. But our airing of our programs are always um, a week behind. Turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verse 14. But as we get ready to jump into our study in the book of Romans, I got to say this. Um, we're going to see where this talks about our faith, our faith. We're going to look at what I think if it hasn't been a memory verse for you, it should be a memory verse for you. Eventually, as we get through this lesson, we're going to look at it. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You shouldn't be. So why is it that we are? And I'm not going to imply that we always are, but there's times when yeah. we just kind of don't necessarily want to jump out there and make it clearly known that we're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not just for lay people, for church members and whatnot. Preachers have that same thing, believe it or not, you know, and, and, um, why is it? Well, it's a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. So let's look at Romans chapter one and, and verse 14. And, and by the way, uh, I, I appreciate Edna, you're almost always early. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm putting up here, come early. And the reason why I'm saying come early, we've had people that have turned into the church and it's a very small church for those on the internet that don't know. It's an extremely small church. They turn in and they see there's only one car in the parking lot or two cars in the parking lot. And guess what they do? They make a U-turn and leave. They, they, it, it scares them off that nobody's here. So if you come early, we have more cars in the parking lot and we can probably quit seeing that happen. Amen. So Romans chapter one and verse 14, it says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So last week, as we went through this, we talked about how Christians are supposed to bear fruit. And there's people that take that thing to both sides of the extreme. There's people who get hold of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that you, by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And they take Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and they misapply that and say, see, we don't do good works. Well, it doesn't say you don't good, do good works. Just read verse 10 right below. It says that you're created, it, it, that he gives you that salvation so that you will do good works. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's a misapplication of scripture. And then the other side of the coin is folks that think that you have to work in order to obtain or earn your salvation or somehow maintain your salvation. And uh, so, uh, you know, they'll acknowledge Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that you're saved by grace through faith. But then they say, well, you can lose it if you don't do all these good works. Well, that's nonsense, too. Um, you cannot lose your salvation. First of all, it's not your salvation to lose. And if you take all those verses that talk about salvation, they talk about everlasting life. Well, if you could lose it, it wouldn't be everlasting, would it? <laughs> And so you take all those verses and, and there's so much proof that you cannot lose your salvation. And praise God, the dispensation of grace that we live in is the only dispensation in which we are unable to lose our salvation. In every other dispensation, uh, the Holy Spirit could come and go. You see, after David, King David sinned with Bathsheba, he prayed, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Uh, the, the implication was that David could lose his salvation over that thing. But it's the faith in which he went to God and asked not to lose it that I believe was his saving grace that kept him from losing it. The fact that he recognized and asked for the Lord's blessing on it. So we're supposed to be fruit bearers. And the Bible says repeatedly that you'll know a tree by its fruit. And so, um, you know, this isn't an original thought of mine by any stretch of the imagination. I heard it probably five or six decades ago at this point in time, but the question comes up, if Christianity today was to become illegal, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> and if the answer is, well, probably not, you need to work on your walk. Um, you're supposed to be a fruit bearer. People should be able to look at you and say, 
that person's a Christian. They should be able to tell by the way that you live your life, by the words that come out of your mouth. You know, that in the time that we live in, you got all kinds of Christians. You got Christians, I call them C and E Christians. They're Christians that only go to church on Christmas and Easter. And uh, are they Christians? Well, I can't say they're not, but boy, their fruit is probably scary. Uh, you have Christians that will come to a Sunday service, but then throughout the week, they live like the devil. Um, I, I heard a story once where a, a guy was faithful to his church. He went to church every time the doors were open, but his heart was, you know, God always looks at and evaluates your motive your attitude toward things. And this person might have been regular in attendance, but his attitude wasn't right towards it. And he had a neighbor that he had been witnessing to. And one day, it's it was a Sunday, and he's getting ready to come to church, and, and uh, his neighbor comes out and says, hey, I got tickets to the big ball game. Do you want to go with me? And he goes, ah, I can't. I have to go to church. Mm. Well, that's a good testimony to his neighbor, isn't it? I have <laughs> to go to church. Yeah, you know what? We should look forward to church. So we should be bearing fruit. It was also evident that Paul reiterates who his audience was throughout Romans 1. So far, he keeps going back over it. And in our text today, he talks about uh, to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Both the Greeks and the barbarians in those times were Gentiles. Yes. Um, barbarians were folks that didn't do anything to try and appease God at all. They called them barbarians. Um, the Greeks were just folks that, and, and Greeks might also, in Paul's mind, uh, mind's eye, include proselytes into the Jewish faith who were Gentiles. Um, but Paul's speaking to folks at Rome, and, and Paul, once again in our current verse, uh, reiterates that he's talking to those who are at Rome in, in verse 15. Uh, so as much as it in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So Paul's focusing on Rome. Now, there's people that I know who struggle with, I think they struggle with, they don't think they struggle with, but I think they struggle with biblical truth. And one of the things that causes them to struggle with biblical truth is, um, and Partially, I think my fault of uh, the one person I'm thinking of because I said you always got to consider who the audience is And so they would take a verse like this Maybe not in this verse in this context, but they'll take verses where they're speaking speaking to somebody specifically And they'll say see that doesn't apply to the church Well, if you're going to take that approach I guess the book of Romans doesn't apply to the church because Paul specified He was talking to the folks at Rome. You see how that doesn't work? Let me give you an example of how uh, people can twist things. Jesus at the Last Supper told the apostles, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Or words that effect, it's not a memory verse, but that's pretty darn close to what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Now, they take that verse and they say, Christians that think they're getting a mansion are misinformed. Jesus was talking to the apostles, not to the church at large. Well, and I think I disagree, I know I disagree with that, but I think that the verse itself uh, gives you enough information to show that that's not the case. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. He didn't say in my father's house are 12 mansions. <laughs> he said there's many mansions. And, and when you look at the context of how Jesus used the term many, uh, he says, straight, uh, uh, broad is the path that leads to destruction. Many there be that fall in their act. Amen. And so when he's talking about many, he's talking about not 12, he's talking about many. He's talking about, and so um, we're gonna talk about that whole deal about the mansions. Um, I'm not sure if it's this service or if it's the one coming up, but we're gonna be talking about that in a little bit more detail. But you can't just say, um, I mean, let's say, if you're gonna take that approach that you look at the audience and that is the only people that it applied to, what, what did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I guess the thief on the cross was the only person that was saved because he was talking specifically to the thief on the cross. 
You know, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So Paul's reiterating the fact that he's speaking to the folks at Rome and the fact that he is preaching the gospel to those who are at Rome would mean that he is speaking both to the saved and the lost. And you say, well, if he's preaching the gospel, why is he speaking to the saved? That's a great question. Paul wanted to preach the gospel to the lost so that they'll get saved, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we reiterate the gospel over and over again in this church. We don't know who the audience is. We don't know. And, and even if somebody's been professing faith for a long time, there's people that are deceived about salvation. There's people whose motive to, to get saved wasn't that they were a sinner that needed to be saved. Their motive was their buddies at a church camp were saying, you need to go down to the altar. You need to go down there. And if they went down because of peer pressure, they didn't get saved. And uh, so he wanted to preach to the saved and he wanted to preach to the lost, to the lost so that they could get saved. And beyond that, as far as knowing who the audience is, this has an internet portion to its ministry. Who knows might tune in that needs salvation. So we go over the gospel on almost every service, if not every service. Uh, when my mom was still alive, her preacher, uh, she'd talk about her son, the preacher to him, and I think he got tired of it. But he, he uh, ended up tuning in to some of my messages, obviously, because he went to my mom at one point in time and he said, you know, a preacher doesn't have to say over and over again that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, who do you suppose he was speaking to? Um, but you want to know what? Preachers should say that over and over and over and over again. Uh, there was a preacher, I can't remember who it was historically now off the top of my head. It'll come to me at 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> But right now, as it's coming to me from the Holy Spirit, I can't remember the preacher's name, but he preached message after message after message on, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. And somebody finally went to him and said, why do you keep preaching on ye must be born again? And he said, the reason is because ye must be born again. <laughs> and uh, going back to folks that misapply scripture by looking at the audience, I had a person that actually told me that it was only Nicodemus that must be born again because Jesus was specifically talking to Nicodemus at night and that that doesn't apply to the church. Well, that's crazy. You've got to be born again. And you want to know why you have to be born again? Your first birth was not a good birth. Your first birth, you were born into sin. Now you need to be born into the spirit world. And the fact that we're born again is another proof that you can't lose your salvation because you can't be unborn once you're born. And so um, you must be born again, folks. And that's speaking to the church. That's speaking to, and, and I know that there's folks that have a problem with even referring to the church as the church because in their mind's eye, the church, which I think the literal definition of church is gathering, and the church existed before Christ, in their mind's eye, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And, and um, if you look at it in terms of it being a gathering, then I guess that's true. They gather at the synagogue. They never called themselves a church, not once. They called themselves a people, uh, the people of Israel, the children of Israel. And so um, I don't mince, I don't get caught up in itsy bitsy details like that. The people who are Christians today refer to themselves as the church. So if I'm going to say the church, they know who I'm talking about. And, and for simplicity, I'm not going to change my terminology because people understand it that way. So he wanted to preach the gospel to, to the saved folks, though, as well, because he wanted to affirm in their hearts the salvation that they had received. Now you gotta remember, this is the very early church. There was a whole bunch of mixed up stuff going on. The apostles had to get together on a fairly regular basis to talk about different issues, to go to the Lord, to get answers for what the true doctrine at the, in this new dispensation would be. God uh, had just left the dispensation of the law and you, gotta, you have to take this into consideration. They had just left the dispensation of the law and were entering into the dispensation of grace. 
things had changed. Now, God didn't change. And listen, folks, God's plan didn't change. God didn't, each dispensation that changed, it didn't change because God says, oh, I didn't see that coming. I better make a new plan. It's not how it worked. God's plan is just like learning scripture. It's here a little, there a little, precept upon precept and precept upon precept. It started off with a dispensation of innocence. Adam and Eve didn't sin. They, were, they had eternal life just coming into it. The only thing they had to do is not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the only thing they had to do. As soon as they ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, they died spiritually and things changed. And it wasn't that God watched that take place Watch Adam and Eve fall, and he goes, man, I didn't see that coming. He knew Adam and Eve were going to fall. Not because he predestined them to fall, but he just knew that he gave them a free will, and he knew the power of Satan, and he knew that Satan would go and tempt them, and he knew that they would fall to that temptation. And so we went from the dispensation of innocence right into the dispensation of conscience, Man wasn't ready to hear you're going to have a Messiah that's going to come and die on a cross. And, and uh, man wasn't ready for that. So God put a conscience into Adam and Eve and their descendants that when they sinned, they felt dirty. Know you know, and, and there's been times in your life, I'm sure of it, there certainly have been times in my life that you find yourself in an environment, whatever that environment may be. I'm not necessarily saying it's the the dredges of the world but they find themselves in an environment where they just feel like they have to take a shower after they get out of it and it's not because there was dirt in the air it's because their conscience told them that where they were even if they're there just by chance it's not like they plan to go there necessarily and listen i've had that experience in churches i've gone to visit churches on vacation or whatever and you go into the church and, and the spirit in the church, you can feel it almost the minute you walk through the door. And, and then as the service proceeds, you you can feel it even more. It's like, man, I, I just need to go get cleaned up after sitting through that. And uh, But it could, be, it could be the dredges. It could be that you went into a bar that you didn't belong in. Um, it's funny how Christians go places they shouldn't go. And then when things happen to them, they say, how could God let this happen to a Christian? Well, it probably wouldn't have happened to you <laughs> if you hadn't gone where you shouldn't have gone. You know, it, the, the types of things that happen in bars, Christians should know. Even if you're not against drinking. And listen, people have asked me, preacher, do you teach that you can't drink? Here's what I teach. If it's right, do it. <laughs> If it's wrong, quit it. If it's wrong and you can't quit it, your issue's with God, not with me. Now, I personally believe that drinking alcoholic beverages is wrong. The Bible says, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived by, thereby is not wise. So to engage in that, first of all, you're not wise. But just from a common sense standpoint, even if you think drinking alcoholic beverages is a okay, just from a common sense standpoint, what kind of things happen at bars? And as a Christian, do you belong there? So you go to the bar and something happens that uh, you didn't think should happen to a Christian and you say, why didn't God protect me? Well, why didn't you stay away from a place that you shouldn't have been at to begin with? Anyway, enough on that. So uh, we're in the, we've got the dispensation of the law had just ended and the dispensation of grace started. And the fact that Paul is going to now preach to the saved, the gospel, shouldn't be a surprise to us at all. Because even if they were saved, they're probably not grounded in what the gospel is because it's a brand new concept. There are still people in the current year that we're living in that have made up the profession of faith, but they don't have the gospel settled in their heart. You know, I think of some of the people that I've led to the Lord in passing, you know, not, not in their passing away, but just in, in life. You know, the ships that pass in the night. Our paths cross, I witness to them. They make a profession of faith. They go their way, they, I go my way. Never see them again. And who knows if they ever get discipled 
or if they're run, run, running around a child of light in darkness, not knowing anything. Usually if I lead somebody to the Lord, I try to give them a Bible and encourage them to read their Bible. But sometimes you don't have that opportunity. Um, Lisa and I have, have had people that, that needed a ride someplace. And in that ride, I witnessed to them. Most of those folks, though, claim to be saved. They just want to get the preacher off their back. <laughs> And, uh, and, and then when you get to talking about their life, you, you, you realize that you, you can't look at somebody and look at their life and say they're not saved. Preachers do that. Christians do that. We don't have the right to do that. We don't know if they're saved or not. We can look at them and look at their fruit and say they're not living right. We don't know if they're saved or if they're lost. That's between them and God. So also these Christians in Rome, a lot of them were saved when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. And we've gone over Acts chapter 2. It really wasn't a message of salvation, but salvation came through that message. It was a message of the kingdom being offered to Israel. But folks, the nation of Israel rejected it, but the people, that, the individuals that received it got saved. They got saved. And so if you remember when we went over that um, lesson from Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter failed to mention anything about blood atonement. So these folks didn't understand. The folks who got saved at that meeting, they, they didn't know anything about a blood atonement. Peter never said a single word about salvation by grace through faith. They, they probably still thought, I got to do the law. As a matter of fact, we know they thought that because that is one of the things throughout the New Testament is do we still do the law or do we not do the law? That was one of the accusations that came against the Apostle Paul all the time. The Jews would take him and say, He's teaching people that they don't have to do the law. Hmm. And so uh, you got to always remember when you're reading the book of Acts, Acts is a transitional book. God is, is showing his apostles this new dispensation and the, the rules of that dispensation. Uh, God is leaving the dispensation that they were living in their whole life. Now, there should be a lesson to, for us in that. And, and I'm going to say this because I think it's extremely important. There should be a lesson in that. These apostles and the disciples that got saved in Acts 2 and, and other folks that got saved after that because people were going around winning folks to Christ, amen? But they didn't understand the entire gospel. They didn't understand the, the New Testament had not been written yet. It was in the process of being written. They had no point of reference other than signs and wonders and miracles. And if you go through history, every dispensation ends in tragedy. Every dispensation ends in, in a total apostasy of the people. And every new dispensation starts with signs and wonders so that God can guide man into the new right way. Not that God's plan change. God's plan all along was these seven steps that he calls seven dispensations. And you say, what do you mean God called them dispensations? Look it up in your Bible. Paul makes reference of dispensations, I think, four or five times. And so a dispensation is a godly concept, not just something that man made up. And so uh, there, the, the book of Acts is this transitional book that they're leaving one dispensation and going into another um, dispensation. And these folks that got saved really didn't know the wherewithal and what all this salvation meant. A uh, great preacher once said that when you get saved, you get saved in an instant. It's not something that you work your way into salvation. Salvation is something the minute that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved that very instant. And so he says, this preacher would say, you get saved in an instant, but then you spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what took place and what all is incorporated into that salvation. And that's called growing in grace. Growing in grace isn't that you grow into salvation. Now, I, I, I got to make something clear in this because I know there's people that feel like they have grown into salvation. And I know from their perspective why they say that. Lisa could argue that she grew into salvation because she can look through her life how God had had like guided her path 
to the point of, of salvation. And every step of the way, she'd make changes in her life to try and fill that path. And so she can say, I grew into salvation, but her salvation actually took place in a moment when it all came together in her mind. And she'll even talk about that. I heard she, she I, I unwittingly led her to Christ. I thought she was a Christian, but I'm witnessing to somebody else. And as I'm talking to them about the grace of God and accepting Jesus Christ, it just hit her at that moment. It all came together. This is what all these things meant right up to this point. And the minute she accepted that, it wasn't that her salvation was a gradual process, although God used a process to open her eyes along the way. Her salvation happened in that moment that it all came together. And so Paul was given further revelation after Acts chapter 2. And I'm sure that one of Paul's goals was to establish within the hearts of the Romans the full gospel that God had revealed to him. By the time Paul's writing the book of Romans, Paul had been given revelation in, in, uh, of the dispensation that we live in, and we're going to see that as we go through the book of Romans. So back to Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And uh, when we get to that phrase, the just shall live by faith, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on that because of a false teaching that's going on in the time that we live in, that um, it's Christ's faith that saves us, not our faith. And so, um, you know, there seems to be a lot of new teachings coming up. And Lisa the other day brought up a, an excellent point to me that I never considered it that way. I, I stated earlier in this message that every dispensation ends in total apostasy. We're at the end of the church age, folks. We're at the end of the dispensation of grace. As we watch things materialize in the Middle East right now with Israel and all that stuff, Never before has there been so much st stuff going on in the history of the world that are biblical prophecy of the end times than right now. And truly, the rapture of the church could happen this spring. I'm not a date setter. I'm not saying it's going to happen this spring. But truly, everything is in place that it could happen this spring. You say, why are you saying spring? Because of the book, Song of Solomon, where the king says to his bride... Uh, the snow is melted, the flowers are blooming, come up hither. That's a picture of the rapture of the church because when Christ calls us, he's going to say, come up hither. <laughs> and it, it talks about when the snow is melted and the flowers are blooming. So in my mind's eye, and there's other references too, but I'm not teaching a lesson on the rapture today. But in my mind's eye, the rapture is going to take place in the spring. So... Verse 16 is an excellent, excellent memory verse. If you haven't memorized it, you should. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So we should never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We shouldn't. But unfortunately, sometimes we are. And by ashamed, I'm not necessarily thinking that you feel shamed. You just don't want to get out there to where you stick out like a sore thumb and everybody, you know, you find yourself in a crowd of unbelievers and, and they might be wanting to do something wrong. And maybe you just go along with it instead of saying, Hey folks, this is wrong. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'll see y'all later. I'm not going to take part on this. I'm a Christian. You say, well, that's not the gospel of Christ. No, but it's just being a, it's in a form as being ashamed of your savior that you go along with it instead of standing for truth. And we should never be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He hung on a cross for us when he shouldn't have. We should take teasing. We should take harassment. We should take persecution. And really, we should take it all willingly. We shouldn't fight them back. You know, somebody who uh, in business files a complaint over religious um, discrimination or persecution, I'm not sure that's biblical. 
If, you, if you're working at a place where they don't like Christians and they're persecuting you, maybe it's time to find another job. Maybe that's the case. So uh, Jesus said, and people, people get mad at me over my passive approach because I am a conscientious objector. <laughs> And I do have a passive approach. And people say, we have the right to defend ourselves. Well, Jesus said, if somebody smacks you on the right side of your face, turn to the other side so they can smack you over there too. He didn't say smack them back. You have the right to defend yourself. Um, we're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to pray for those that persecute us. And you see examples of that in history. Uh, people that were thrown in prison and tortured for Christ, they'd tell their guards all the time, I'm praying for you. And that would usually get them a beating. And they'd still say, I'm praying for you. And you know what happened? Some of those guards got saved because of the testimony of the Christian that was submitting themselves to it. The statement, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the subject in that statement is the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of, well, what are you not ashamed of? The gospel of Christ. And you say, so what, if, if the, being ashamed of the gospel of Christ preacher is different than being ashamed of Christ, what's the difference? And that's a good question too. Here may be a good example of it. You come across somebody or there's somebody you've known for years that needs to get saved. You're having a conversation the Holy Spirit places on your heart to witness to them, and you say, no, they're not ready yet. I guess the Holy Spirit would know whether they're ready better than whether you would know they're ready. And so if you refuse to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, that could qualify as being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why would you not want to witness? And we, listen, we're all guilty. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm better than you. We're all guilty. I can't say that every single time the Holy Spirit put on my heart to witness to somebody that I was faithful and did it. I wish I could, but I can't. What's your motive for not doing what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do? Scared. You're scared. You don't want to be labeled a, back in my days, they called him Jesus freak. You don't want to be looked at as some religious fanatic. And yet the hypocrisy of that is you have no problem going to a ball game, painting your skin blue and <laughs> yelling and screaming with orange hair. You, you talk about church and say, well, I don't want to be a fanatic. Then you'll go to the ball game and you'll dress like a total buffoon and jump up and down and scream and holler and get mad. And, and um, you know what they call that? Fanaticism. <laughs> You're, you're willing to be a fanatic for the ball team you like, but you're not willing to be a fanatic for the Lord Jesus Christ, huh? So the verse identifies that it's the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. What is the power of God? Well, uh, what is that power of God unto salvation? Well, that's defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. This is the gospel in a nutshell. And usually when I look at this, I, I go uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. But for today, we're just going to look at 3 through four, three and 4. And Paul's talking to the church of Corinth. And he said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received. So Paul's going to tell, he's preaching and he's saying, the first thing I did is I told you what God gave me in Revelation is basically what is saying. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Scriptures, excuse me. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the Bible defines what the gospel of Christ is right here in these two verses. And we see that in Romans that I quote all the time when I'm telling you how to get saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Because Christ died for your sins mm -hmm. and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The whole point, and we'll see it as we go on, if Christ didn't rise again, then your faith is vain. 
and you're not saved at all. You're still in your sins. You're undone. Christ had to get the victory over death, over the grave, over hell, which he did. Praise the Lord. Amen. So when you believe on Jesus Christ, God's power to you is that Christ died for your sins. That's God's power for you. If you confess him as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Uh, so now God's power goes far beyond that. His power for you unto salvation is that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. But, but God's power, after that power for you to salvation, his power goes far beyond that. He's not limited to that power. Uh, but for the saved sinner, that's the meat and potatoes of God's power. You know, what's in it for me? And God's power for you is that he died for your sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, um, it is God's power that is able to forgive our sins. That's God's power. It's God's power that is able to keep us safe in his love to where we can't lose our salvation. That's God's power. Uh, it's God's power that will overthrow all the powers of darkness by the end of this little battle between him and Satan. That's God's <coughs> power. Um, it's God's power that will establish a mansion that where he is, we may be also. It's God's power that will strengthen the Holy Scriptures despite how man tries throughout the years to change it. God preserved his word just like he said he would and he preserved it in a King James Bible I don't know how anybody with a sane mind can say that all the Bibles are one is as good as the other they all say the same thing when you can easily show they don't say the same thing the new all the new versions every single one of the new versions takes away from the deity of Christ you think the Holy Spirit will love those men to take away from the deity of Christ that's how Satan operates, folks. Subtle changes. He is the most subtle. What did he do to Adam and Eve? He said, yea, hath not God said, thou shalt eat of all the trees of knowledge of good and evil. That was a small change. Only thing he left off was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But you know, I know you're right. It's just that in all these versions, they take away. But see, they have verses in them where they say it is. You see, they do have... You know, they that's the whole point. The they, point they, is that they keep, they, they keep some of them. Oh, that's but the they, whole point. Because they if they took it all away, away you'd throw the book out. Yeah. But they keep some of they them because that makes because the person that's deceived by it feel comfortable because there's still verses that they say. They, yeah. 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 But you don't have the pure word of God. And so I like to give the analogy. If I came up here with a, a small glass of water that I could prove was 100% pure, and you're thirsty, wouldn't you want to drink that water? But if I put one drop of arsenic in it, would you still want to drink that water? It's no longer 100% pure. Yeah. It might be 99.9% .9 pure, but that 0.1% that's not pure is enough to kill you. And so, yes, there's a lot of truth in those new versions of the Bible, and then that's a great point. But there's enough that's taken away that you're going to limit how you can grow in the Lord if you are saved. And you may have a completely wrong idea of what salvation is if you're lost. Now, I've seen King James people who ignorantly say, if you were led to the Lord out of any Bible other than the King James, you're not really saved. Now, that's nonsense. And they, they justify that by saying faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which is a Bible verse. But you want to know what there is, the Word of God, in those new versions, just not pure words of God. And so I can take any new version of the Bible and lead somebody to Christ out of any new version of the Bible. There's enough in there that you can lead somebody to Christ. But they're going to, some of the folks that I really respect for their, their spirit and their wisdom and their knowledge, and I believe they're saved and born again and all that good stuff, and I believe they're good teachers and I believe they're good preachers, but they don't have the Word of God. And I look at them and I say, how sad, because they're better than I am. 
as far as delivery and as far as, as teaching and all that stuff, they're better than I am. Boy, just think how powerful they'd be if they had the true word of God, <laughs> how powerful they would be. So it's God's power. We're speaking about God's power. We got off on a little bit of a bunny trail, but it's, it's God's power. And we got on that bunny trail because it's God's power that will strengthen the Holy Scriptures despite how man tries to change it throughout the years, how he preserves it. And it's God that preserves it, not man. It's God's power that holds everything in the entire existence of everything, whether spiritual or physical. It's God's power that holds that stuff together. If God wanted to release, you know, science, and I like the phrase that you give science enough time, it'll catch up with the Bible. But science says that, that even though we think we're solid, we're not solid. We're a bunch of atoms and all that stuff, and there's air in between each one of them. And somehow, and they don't understand how, I understand how, somehow all these atoms are held together in a way that forms a body. <laughs> Well, it's God. It's the power of God. It's God that holds everything together. And so you need to be very careful of people, especially preachers, who place all their emphasis on the Holy Ghost, implying that the Holy Ghost is the power of God. That's not what Scripture teaches. The Holy Ghost is powerful. The Holy Ghost is a member of the Trinity. And the Holy Ghost is power. The Holy Ghost... Because he is God, has the power of God, but he is he is not, he is not the power of God. He, because he is God, has access to the power of God, but he is not the power of God. The Holy Scriptures, scriptures tell us that it's the gospel that is the power of God. That's how God is going to defeat Satan. That's what we're here for. We're here in that battle against God and Satan. And it's this world playing out, this little teeny speck of dust, the third rock from the sun. <laughs> and what's playing out on this little planet is going to determine who wins that war. And so the scientists and the egotists and the educated people that say, Boy, to think God created this whole vast universe and universe after universe, because uh, they're saying now there's multiple universes. Uh, God created all that only to put life on one little speck. That doesn't even make sense. It does if you stop and consider that God's showing how big he is and how small we are. <laughs> it does make sense. God is infinite beyond what we can even comprehend. And just to say God is powerful is far too much of an understatement to even get a basic grasp of the power of God. God is, he, he would beat Satan taken, if God was taking a nap and Satan had all of his forces lined up against him. Satan is so deceived thinking that he stands a chance against this all powerful God. Like I said, it's, it's God that's holding the molecules together that even form Satan. All God has to do is let go and Satan vanishes into the air. But he's not smart enough to recognize that. So the Holy Scriptures tells us that it's the gospel that's the power of God. It's the gospel given to mankind that's going to end up, end up ultimately being the defeat of Satan, who was Lucifer. And um, Satan's going to be cast into that lake of fire. And the Bible says he's going to be covered with worms. You know who those worms are? <laughs> People who were sent to hell. Uh, science has it just backwards. We're not evolving, we're devolving. And the folks that go to hell, they're going to go from a human down to a worm. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Their worm, that's who they are, they're the worm. And it's not going to die, and their fire is not quenched. But Paul doesn't just stop with the phrase, that phrase, though. He goes on to say to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And we're going to pick up with that concept of to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, because that's another little phrase in Scripture that gets misapplied, misunderstood. Uh, but Paul says that the gospel of Christ to the Jew first and also to the Greek, 
We're going to take a look at that next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Man, I thank you for your power. And we enjoy your power. We see it manifested in our lives from time to time, Lord. And we know that your power is not limited simply to the Holy Ghost. We're not discrediting the Holy Ghost. We believe the Holy Ghost is part of your being. And so obviously being part of your being, he has power, but he is not, your power is not simply limited to what the Holy Ghost does. And so Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for exercising your power and protecting us and preserving your word and watching after us. God, we pray that in this upcoming service that your power would be demonstrated there and that your we would be pleasing to you in that message. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take about a 12-minute break and we'll come back for the regular.